But welcome, um, good evening, and, and a warm welcome to an evening of art, craftsmanship, and imagination. My name is Petra Kralichkova, and I'm the executive director at the National Museum of Toys and Miniatures, also known as TM, and I'm honored to welcome you today. Artist Chris Toledo has been making miniatures since he was a child. For Toledo, making 112 scale works of art represents a culmination of meticulous design and precision. Born and living in Los Angeles, Toledo draw inspiration from architectural elements across LA and has now included the Nelson Atkins, iconic Kirkwood Hall and Roselle Court in his creative repertoire. In recognition, of Toledo's exceptional design, TM commissioned him to create the Miniature Art Museum, which will be unveiled later this summer at TM. In many ways, this project, consisting of five miniature galleries and a central atrium, is not unlike the opening of a new wing of a full-scale museum. I'll let that sink in. With this expansion, TM will increase the capacity to present rotating exhibitions of paintings, sculptures, and decorative arts made by miniature artists inspired by well-known artworks throughout art history. Artist Chris Toledo will discuss his creative process and inspiration that have shaped his artistic journey, facilitated by Dr. William Keyes Rudolph the Deputy Director of Curatorial Affairs at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, and Dr. Madeline Rislow, the Senior Manager of Learning and Engagement at the National Museum of Toys and Miniatures. Before the talk, Amy McCune, TM's Curator of Collections, will take us on a brief journey through the rich history of fine-scale miniatures. But first, I would like to thank you for being here today and supporting the transformative power of art, both in full scale and the realm of miniatures. I would also like to expand my gratitude for our colleagues from the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, namely Julian Zagasakosia, Director and CEO, Karen Christensen, former Chief Operating Officer, and Anne Manning, Deputy Director of Learning and Engagement, both of whom have served as past and current board members at TM. Thank you for your leadership in shaping the longstanding relationship between our organizations. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the profound impact of one person, Ms. Barbara Marshall. She was a passionate collector, a patron of miniature artists, and a beloved docent at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. Together, with Miss Mary Harris Francis, they envisioned a museum that would bring their collection of toys and miniatures to the Kansas City community. Because of their vision, we can enjoy this remarkable museum as it is today. So in honor of Miss Marshall's contribution to all art, and especially fine scale miniatures, I welcome you to immerse yourself in the magic of workmanship of this remarkable art form. Thank you and enjoy this evening. <laughs> I have to do some technical things first. Yeah, that's good. So as Petra said, I'm Amy McCune. I'm the Curator of Collections at the National Museum of Toys and Miniatures. And I've been given the task tonight of taking about five minutes to talk about the history of fine scale miniatures. I hope some of you find that as humorous as I did. Um, so I'm going to read, because I don't want to take too much extra time. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge in this talk the contributions of the museum's founders the current and former staff, and also Laura Taylor, whose 2016 master's thesis 
codified the history and played an important role in identifying fine scale miniature work as a significant art movement. Although miniatures have long been a human fascination as expressed in many different cultures, the fine scale miniatures that we are discussing tonight has its origins in the early 20th century, with an explosion of activity starting in the 1970s. These miniatures are artist made creations to a specific scale, usually one inch equals 12 inches, incorporating the details of and sometimes even functioning like the work that inspired the miniature artist. There are three early influential projects. In 1921, Princess Marie Louise, cousin of King George V, proposed creating a doll's house as a gift for the king's wife, Queen Mary, who was a well-known uh, lover of miniatures. This project was intended to boost the economic recovery of England after World War I by employing British craftsmen and highlighting their skills. And the first exhibition of Queen Mary's dollhouse was at the British Empire Exhibition in 1924. In 1928, silent film star Colleen Moore commissioned Horace Johnson to create a fantastical fairy castle as a distraction during her divorce. The fairy castle was completed in 1935, and Moore arranged for it to be shown in multiple U.S. locations <coughs> to raise funds for children's charity. The final and arguably most significant miniature projects of this period was the Thorn Rooms, around 100 miniature period rooms representing the best of American and European architecture. The rooms were created in the 1930s by Narcissa Niblack Thorn with a cadre of craftsmen. In various configurations, the Thorn Rooms were shown at three World's Fairs between 1933 and 1940. TM recently acquired one of the early Thorn Rooms made in 1933, 1934, and it just went on view, so I invite you to come over to the museum to see one here in Kansas City. All three projects captured the public's imagination and served as a catalyst for a growing interest in the field of miniatures. Preeminent Kansas City collector Barbara Marshall was inspired by these projects. Her collecting was influenced by her experiences working in the art department at Hallmark and also as a docent at the Nelson Atkins. In the 1950s, Marshall discovered the shop of Eric Pearson in New York City and purchased her first piece by him, a Windsor Comeback Rocker. This is the first of over 280 works by Eric Pearson collected by Barbara Marshall, who was not alone in her admiration for Pearson's work. He made several pieces for the Thorn Rooms and his works were being collected and are still coveted by other collectors and miniature artists. Today, TM owns 351 works by Pearson. In 1937, artist Eugene Cupjack read about the Thorn Rooms in Life magazine and sent samples of his work to Narcissa Thorne, who hired him to help with the third set of rooms, the American Rooms. This was the beginning of a 30-year partnership between the two, and it's estimated that Cupjack created over 700 miniature rooms in his career. While there are other notable artists pursuing miniatures in the mid 20th century, what was happening could not really be described as an art movement. But that all changed in the 1970s. Individuals with an interest in miniatures came together in a new organization, the National Association of Miniature Enthusiasts, founded in 1972. Miniature clubs formed around the country, and those making miniatures started participating in shows where collectors could purchase their work. During this time, some of those pursuing the craft of miniatures started identifying themselves as artists and made connections with collectors. In 1978, a group of artists came together to form the International Guild of Miniature Artisans with the goal of protecting the interests of the arts, the artists, and promoting miniatures as an art form. In understanding the blossoming of the movement in the 1970s, it's important to look at the cultural context of the time. Historically, the desire to create miniatures satisfied a need to create a space that one could control, often in sharp contrast to what was happening in the larger world. After the post-World War II baby boom and an age of greater prosperity for some, the 1960s was a tumultuous decade, encompassing a major war, human rights movements, and deaths of political and cultural leaders. This was followed by preparation for the nation's bicentennial in 1976 that sparked nostalgia for a reimagined past 
that seemed much simpler than the current times. Fine scale miniature artists use the material culture of these long past eras as inspiration for their work. Artists working in miniatures, while they are often copying full-size works, do make choices that contribute to the success of the smaller version. For example, the artist would use different wood with a smaller grain, appropriate to the scale of the miniature, or a painter might alter the palette used in the original work to contribute to its success. This has been described as not solving problems in the styles that they reproduce, but instead solving problems in the art of making miniatures. There are many incredible artists producing miniatures today, but rather than speaking about all of them, I invite you to visit TM to see the work. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Madeline Rislow, Senior Manager of Learning and Engagement at TM, to further explore one of those artists and his new commission for TM. Thank you. All right, and I would like to invite uh, Dr. William Keyes Rudolph and artist Chris Toledo up to the stage as well, or our little, I guess, stage area here, uh, as we're going to have a conversation together uh, for about the next 30 minutes or so about Chris's work uh, and learn about this new commission, this really fantastic commission that uh, will be at TM shortly and that we uh, are so excited about doing this talk here because one of the inspirations for it was uh, were elements of this building so we're very excited about that so in addition as we're kind of to give you a format for the rest of the conversation tonight we will will have our conversation we will leave about 10 or 15 minutes at the end uh, for your questions and uh, i'm sure you will have many of them uh, we will try to get to a lot of them before the end of the uh, event at seven when the event ends at 7 30. but if you still find yourself with pressing questions and you really like to talk to chris more we would like to invite all of you to tm tomorrow uh, between 9 and 11, you are all welcome to stop by the National Museum of Toys and Miniatures for a meet and greet with Chris, and you can see the space where the Miniature Art Museum will be installed later this summer. So uh, with that, uh, let's start the conversation, uh, Chris, and we'll start with a really easy question of, tell us your life story. No, <laughs> no. Uh, what... I'll be a little bit more specific. What is it about, I think it's so interesting to think about, okay, how does somebody get started in anything that they do? But fine scale miniature making is so specific. How did that happen for you? Um, I think that story kind of starts in Argentina with uh, my family. That's where my family emigrated from back in the 1970s. And um, in that time, most of my family, they all lived on farms. And, you know, at this point, it's, you know, the, the late 70s. And, you know, we really had to, you know, kind of be makers. So my family, you know, we they used to make their own shoes, they used to make their own clothes, they used to make their own tools, you know, so that, you know, that kind of, you know, ability to just kind of make something out of nothing was kind of the first, you know, kind of, you know, the first part of the story that kind of leads to where I kind of end up in this story. And, you know, it just kind of, you know, had instilled in me this ability to kind of, you know, be resourceful, you know, more than anything. And, um, and it kind of started when I was about nine or 10 years old, and I actually came across miniatures by accident. Um, I was actually, you know, in a dentist office, and I was, you know, sitting in there waiting to go in. And right in front of me was this magazine called Nutshell News. I'd never heard of it before. Um, I mean, I think some of you might know that magazine as Dollhouse Miniatures now. Um, but, you know, one of its previous <laughs> incarnations was Nutshell News. And in that magazine was, um, you know, prominently featured this artist couple, Pat and Noel Thomas. And they're, you know, at that point, seven or eight years old, when you hear Dollhouse, you think, you know, Barbie, Malibu's pink dream house, you know, that, you know, by Mattel. And so it, after... Which are also great. Yeah, I just no, want to make no sure. No disrespect to Barbie, you know, she's got great taste. But, you know, at that age, you know, that's what, when you think dollhouse, that's what you think, you know. And so after seeing this, I was, you know, completely like, okay, what is this? Like, this is one of the coolest things I've ever seen. And, you know, prior to that, um, 
growing up, my father was in construction. So we did construction. Um, he did a lot of woodworking. And so I was always kind of in that environment already, you know, having come from this family that, you know, most of my family has the ability uh, to this day. I'm still very impressed that some of my family was actually able to make a lot of the things that they needed to, you know, survive. And so we always kind of had this, this, you know, great woodworking space in our garage. And, um, and growing up, my dad, you know, he would take me on a lot of these projects with him. And so while he was, you know, working on these beautiful old houses, I would always, you know, be wandering around, getting into places that I probably shouldn't be in, you know what I mean? But, you know, as that age, I was so just, you know, enamored by these architectural marvels, um, you know, this historic architecture and, you know, having a father who also appreciated it, he really kind of instilled in me, like, you know, what was important about these, you know, architectural you know, elements. And so I was, you know, instantly just obsessed. And so when I found this miniature stuff, like, you know, I was always, I was like, okay, what is this? This is so cool. And so I instantly wanted to get into it. Um, and so I kind of just started with kits, you know, that's, you know, and to this day, that's when I tell people who want to get into miniatures, like, that's how I started. That's one of the best ways to do it because it's the great way to like start experimenting with style and like the, the scale and kind of getting, developing that miniature eye that, you know, you kind of, kind of develop over the years. And so, you know, it was just like a for fun thing. I love doing it. My dad loved doing it. And so we kind of would get into these big projects together and we'd buy these kits and we'd start building it. And, you know, a lot of these kits, they're really kind of generate, you know, they're still kind of generally geared towards like a play thing. And so, you know, me, who's, you know, someone who really wanted to try to, you know, break out of that box, I kind of started getting these ideas of like, okay, I want to start building my own stuff. And, uh, and so, you know, we would kind of sit there with my dad and we'd create these drawings and, you know, we start building these little structures together. And it just, you know, kind of just became this fun thing that we would do together. And, uh, you know, my grandpa uh, and my grandma, they came up from Argentina and they stayed with us for about a year. And during that year, we would, you know, my grandpa, who also loved to build stuff, he got into it with us. And we, you know, it kind of became this like whole family thing that we kind of get into and we'd all do together. And, you know, that kind of you know, really is what kind of started it, um, you know, and just in general, my mom, she was an artist, she loved to sew, she loved to paint. And so just being in that environment of just like surrounded by art and making things that already, you know, it, that's what kind of started gearing me towards loving miniatures so much. And then, you know, and not just the fact that it was just, you know, the fun, the fun tangibility of miniatures, but the fact that it combined basically every art medium that you can think of, you know, when you think of a miniature, it's like a lot of people think, oh, it's just, you know, a toy or, you know, this, this little thing. But in reality, you're combining woodworking, you're combining painting, you're combining sculpting, you know, when you're finishing these pieces, I love to play with lighting. And, you know, so at that, you know, you start to think of like, you know, almost like set design, you know, how, when you're playing with lighting, how lighting comes through windows and how you want to, you know, bring in this lighting to kind of, you know, show showcase you know certain elements of architecture that you know that kind of you wouldn't normally see when you just look at the piece but if you light the piece in a certain specific way you you know it brings attention to this whole new a aspect of the piece that you would never even expect and so yeah so you know not that that was a long story or anything but that's kind of what started the whole <laughs> you no, know and, that, and all of that is a great uh i think uh great transition to also mention the fact that we're showing some of chris's work here on a loop uh, that shows some of you're talking about the the lighting even of the environment and so much of that shows through in the ways in which you've documented uh, your work here, uh, which is really uh, fascinating to think about. It's not just about the object that you're creating, but it's about how you're conveying it to your audience. Um, so can you recall the first time you really thought of yourself as an artist? I know that's kind of a big like. It's a moment, right? That it's not yeah, just yeah. It's I mean, and it's, from it's, kits it's, to yeah. I'm an artist. And it's something that I actually so kind of, you know, I struggled with for a long time because even though my parents were still very, they were very involved in this process of me creating these things um, growing up, you know, coming from Argentina, wanting the best for their family, they, you know, you know, I, I mean, I've wanted to be an artist since I can remember, you know, literally that is one thing that I've always wanted to do. Um, and, you know, despite the support of them wanting to do all these projects with me, you know, they were always like, no, you need to be a doctor. Uh, you need to be an engineer, especially, you know, in Argentina, literally the golden child of every Argentina family is an engineer. And so that is what they wanted me to do. And, uh, and that's actually what I kind of worked up till, you know, uh, as I was growing up, you know, I really, uh, you know, I was like, okay, well, I, I love art. 
but I want to make mom and dad happy. And so, you know, and having this love of architecture, I was like, okay, uh, maybe, you know, architecture, I think would be something that would be really cool to get into. And so after high school, I actually started going to, you know, taking all the prerequisites to get into an architecture program. And literally about a year into it, I was like, this is not the vibe. Like, this is not what I want, you know, because I, 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 I considered myself a very creative person and I thought very creatively. And, you know, as I was getting into these programs, I was realizing that, like, you know, only top tier famous architects really get to have full creative reign you know what I mean most architects they work for a firm and they're working with a team of people and you know they're kind of working under guidelines where I'm like I just want to do what I want you know and I want to you know create these different styles you know especially having a love for historic architecture I want to bring attention to that and you know some focus onto historic architecture that you know to some degree a lot of people have no regard for and they tear it down or you know to, to build something more modern and so you know miniatures you know it always kind of stayed as like my little like secret hobby because I was always one of, you know, as you know, when you're in high school and you're growing up, you're like, you don't want to tell people that you're playing with dollhouses, you know what I mean? Because that's, you know, people are going to, you know, there's just, there's just you know, there was, you know, at that age, it's just like, you know, a luck that you don't want. And, you know, so it was always one of my like little secret hobbies. And, um, you know, and but that's why I loved it so much, though, because it was it gave me the chance to really be creative architecturally and really focus on these architectural styles and build the things that I wanted to do without having to, you know, have a whole team. And you know, it, it, it kind of became this thing where I can create these tiny tangible objects where I can, you know, express and build multiple styles of architecture and not have to, you know, have this crazy big construction project or, you know, and so that's really what kind of like got me into it. And, you know, to, to this day, like my mom, she's still like, she's still always telling it. She's like, I can't believe that we would always tell you not to be an artist, that there was no career in that. And, you know, and, and it, it's, it's funny because, you know, I, I stayed true to it. I, I stuck, you know, I always told myself, um, like, I don't care what you guys think. I'm going to be an artist, whether you guys like it or not. And, you know, and even though miniatures wasn't the, you know, the, the first, I've, I've, you know, I actually, ventured into many different forms of art so right literally the second I got out of the architecture program I, I got into fashion and I went to school for fashion design um, because I love it was another thing that's very tangible and you can kind of play around with it and so that was you know I went to fashion school that's what I got my degree in and actually worked in the fashion world for 10, 10 years actually um, while still doing miniatures on the side you know still keeping my little secret hobby <laughs> and so um, you know it still it still blows my mind like it was whenever one of those things that I would actually expect that this would actually be what I do full time you know what I mean because you still you know you still have mom and dad's voice in the back like you'll never succeed at this you know so it was one of those things where you know I still have that like you know old country Argentinian guilt in the back of my mind um, but you know it's 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 one of the things that I just I wanted to push for it and you know it just it's kind of started with going on social media and starting to share my work online and you know that was already a big step because I was just like what are people going to say like there's you know these masters in this in this craft that have been doing this for years and they're just you know these crazy big names and like these people that I literally like worship and you know like I don't you know my stuff is going to be you know crap compared to their stuff you know that's just you know how as an artist I feel like we're our own worst critic and that was one of the things that kind of you know, I had to kind of work through in the very beginning and, you know, after share, starting to share my work, so. <laughs> well, Chris, if I could, if I could just pick up, ask you to pick up on kind of an interesting tension that I was hearing in your answer. So it seems like you've done this sort of oscillation between you know, the sort of corporate, meaning like many, you know, sort of working at the beginning with your family and then wanting to sort of do it solely yourself. But there's kind of a tension and if you're thinking about some of the things that you're doing fine scale miniatures of, you know, you're working, you're recreating and interpreting structures, interiors, objects that often relied upon many, many, many hands and the, the subcontracting and the specialization of, you know, entire industries. So how does that tension, how do you resolve that tension, like internally? And do you, 
how do you collaborate these days? What forms does collaboration take? Um, so, I mean, especially when it comes to collaborating, I hate it. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, know, I, I know I do. I actually do enjoy working with other artists, especially uh, especially with the project that I'm working on right now um, for, the, um, for the TM Museum. Uh, that was actually one of the first projects that I've actually had multiple artists involved, um, which has actually been really great because, you know, it, it's kind of, especially with this project, because it kind of gave me the freedom to kind of, you know, have control of what the artists, other artists were doing, as well as just be able to handpick some of the artists that I like fanboy over, especially, you know, cause Bill Robertson right here, <laughs> one of my favorite artists, um, you know, so it, you know, it, it was a little bit difficult at first. Um, I've collaborated. Uh, I did this actually one project. This is one of my first collaborations with another artist a couple years ago. And it was, it actually, I actually, didn't like it at first and then towards the end of it actually ended up being one of my favorite things and I actually collaborate with this artist all the time now um, because it took me out of my own comfort zone um, you know I have you know I just we all have our own specific views on certain things and you know me being an architectural purist I just you know I, I had certain ways that I like to do things certain designs and certain aspects of architecture that I like to portray but having another artist come into this actually took me out of that and actually allowed me to see multiple facets of you know what the project would be um and it also you learn a lot because you know you have your own techniques that you know you develop as an artist and you know these techniques that you become you know very true and specific to but you know another artist might have a different technique that they do or you know a different style or a different format that they like to do the things in and so that kind of you know it, it actually helped me kind of see more facets of the projects and actually be able to see things through different eyes and kind of kind of get an aspect of like how you know this other artist works and how can I incorporate you know how they do their projects into what I do as, as an artist and kind of make you know not I wouldn't say easier but just you know different ways of doing things for sure and picking up on that a little bit how do you approach your research what's your research project like when an when an idea occurs to you um so I mean when it comes especially you know most of my pieces I love working um, early 20th century like late 1900s 20 1920s 1930s that's basically my favorite period to work in because um, I, I think personally, some of the best architect architecture came out during those periods. There was a lot of revival movements, um, you know, so a lot of 1920s pulled from these, you know, beautiful, even more historic styles, you know, they, they would, you know, pull that into their influence and kind of create these, you know, especially growing up in Los Angeles, you know, this neighborhood that's right near me, Hancock Park, it was basically old Hollywood. Most of these mansions that were built were from, you know, old 1920s black and white, you know, silent films. And so there was, you know, it was, there was just, you know, these people had money and they were just like, I just, I want my, you know, I want this European influenced palace. Um, and so I pulled a lot of my influence from that. And, you know, I, it really kind of starts with, you know, being true to the architectural style that I'm trying to do. Um, a lot of my pieces, even though I do like to reproduce certain elements, a lot of my pieces, I like to kind of encompass all of my favorite elements of a specific style, you know. So if I'm doing, you know, one of my first big projects that I did was this um, Spanish health called Casa California. Um, and this project actually started when I was about, mm, probably about 10 years old. I started, you know, first thinking about this project. I, I remember seeing this episode of Bob Vila's Home Again, where he, he literally remodeled and, you know, t this whole beautiful Spanish house in Malibu. And he talked about the history of Spanish style and, you know, and then how it was, it's very, and I very iconic style to California. And so when I did this house, um, you know, I, I started pretty much designing it in my head right around that age. And, you know, I got, a, you know, very far into the design when I realized I'm like, I'm 10 years old. There's no way I'm going to build this house at this age. Like, even with my parents helping me, like, there's no way. Because, you know, I wanted to be true to the scale and I wanted to be true to the style. So I'm like, this house is going to be massive. And it, and it is now that it's almost fully built. It's about, it's, I call it the minivan because it's, it's huge. Um, and so, you know, for that house, there wasn't one specific thing that inspired that project. There was multiple aspects of the Spanish architecture and Mediterranean revival architecture that I wanted to bring into that project. And so, you know, I, I really love going to the source. So, you know, I love going online. There's this website called archive.org where you can find um, 
old catalogs from 1920s, 1930s of like bathroom fixtures. Um, there's old Sears catalogs in there that have like, you know, the, the where you can buy the plans for a house and the materials for a house for, you know, at that point it was like $2,000 and, you know, they ship you a house in pieces and you build it. You know, there's a lot of those example of those houses all over Los Angeles. And so, you know, I love going to like the source for those things, especially since that is my favorite period. I love going, you know, to, and looking at, you know, whatever I can find from that exact period. Um, and, you know, and not, not just that I love finding, you know, I just, I'll go on Zillow and I'll look at home listings um, that, and I'll, I'll always put specifically anything built between, you know, 1900, and 1930s he's just like the latest that I'll look and you know I'll look at the different pieces that the houses that come up within that era and you know you can tell what's been remodeled and what people have ripped out but you know it's it's the it's the historic elements that I love to kind of focus on and pull from that um, so you know when it really comes to you know designing my pieces I really love to go straight to the source you know straight to that period what was coming out of that period of time you know what were people doing what materials were they using you know what what was their influence and and, you know, I kind of try to incorporate that into what I do and try to be as true to that style as I possibly can. I want to pick up on the questions that William has just uh, posed to you, but specifically tie it back to the miniature art museum. So what what collaborations uh, can you talk more about the collaborative process with that project and then can you also talk about just the the entire that research process and how that how did that work with the project that you're currently working on um yeah i mean when it first came to that project um you know it all kind of started with this idea that you know and i thought the second this project was brought forward to me i thought it was brilliant you know this idea of creating a miniature museum to display miniature artwork. Um, you know, I think it's, it's just a cool concept to be able to, you know, properly, dis you know, you, you, there's so many artists in the miniature world that focus on different things. And, you know, there's artists that focus on sculpture and painting and, you know, and me specifically architectural elements. And so I really love this idea because it, it was, you know, I always call my, my, my miniature pieces move and ready miniatures because I don't really work on furniture. I usually, you know, I love working on just a room that someone can buy and they can furnish it themselves, fill it with, you know, pieces that they've collected and to kind of, you know, let them have fun with it. And so this was like the ultimate version of that because you're getting, you know, pieces that, uh, that uh, you know, the International Museum of Toys and Miniature has collected over the years from these incredible artists. And so, you know, that was one of the first things is like, okay, I'm creating, you know, I, I need to do justice to these other artists that are going to have their pieces displayed. But I also don't want to take away from their work. You know, I want to create something that's, you know, going to stand in tandem with their pieces and not only, you know, help showcase their pieces, but also bring a lot of focus to those pieces. Um, you know, so the first thing that kind of, you know, started with that project was kind of just thinking of like, OK, you know, how would this piece be laid out? And you know, that's actually where I pulled a lot of influence from here at the Nelson Atkins. I loved the his, you know, the layout of this museum, the architecture of this museum, you know, the, the neoclassical elements that, you know, kind of make it up as, as well as just the basic layout of the museum with like this beautiful central space you know that's flooded with light and then you know that kind of branches off into these gallery spaces and so you know that's what kind of started the first you know the first talks of this project was really just kind of like figuring out what that was going to be um you know and then as we kind of progressed it was you know we started talking about what other artists i was going to bring in to do other pieces for this museum and you know i'm the first to, you know i will definitely say that there are artists you know that have the, you know like i said there are artists that have their own specific things that they are extremely good at and so you know with this project i was like okay what artists that i completely admire could i pull into this that are going to do you know a hundred times better than anything i could ever do you know and so that's really what it, you know it really came down to when putting together the team um you know for this project was okay like who who do i know can do certain things that uh, that you know and especially since this piece is going to be in a museum no pressure um it's you know it was one of those things where i was like okay i really you know this needs to be something that people are going to want to come and look at over and over again for years to come 
Um, and so that's really what, it, you know, the basis of this was, you know, when putting that team together, it's just, okay, who's going to be the best at what, you know, and, and, you know, aside on like, who am I going to work with best? And, you know, and so far, I mean, it's, you know, the team has been really great. It's been really amazing to put this whole project together and kind of, you know, s see how it's evolved over the last couple of months and how it's evolving into the finished product in the next couple of months. So, so what specifically, um, are you having other artists work on? Like what elements have you asked them to assist with and collaborate with you on? Um, yeah, so I mean, obviously, you know, number one, Bill Robertson, he's done an, a, an incredible amount of work for that for the museum already. And, you know, and having, you know, been in the miniature world for the last couple of years, I've, you know, I've become more and more familiar of the stuff that I've seen him work on. And, you know, talking to him, like he's always told me how he, you know, he's, he loves the metal work. And, you know, if, if any of you follow Bill online, he has probably the most meticulous tool collection of any artist I have ever seen in my entire life, in my existence, basically. And so that was, you know, I was like, instantly I was like, okay, anything that's going to be metal work, like I, I know exactly who I want to do that because, you know, it has to be the best. And, um, and so that's really, you know, what kind of pulled from there. Um, and then uh, another artist that I included was Frank Crescente, who is actually known for chandeliers, but he also does incredible flooring, which is something he's lesser known for. But I am and like he does these parquet floors that are completely unreal. Um, and so, you know, the gallery spaces uh, of the museum project, each, you know, there's five gallery wings and each one of them had these, you know, very large, incredible parquet floors. So I was like, OK, that's, you know, definitely who I'm going for for that. Um, another artist, uh, Barbara Sabia, she is known for doing incredible stained glass window. Um, if you guys haven't heard of her work, definitely look it up. It's incredible. You look at her work and you think you're looking at an actual stained glass window. Um, so yeah, she was, you know, my first person to go to when it came to doing the stained glass. Um, and uh yeah, I mean, it was definitely like trying to figure out, you know, who was going to be best at doing what. And, you know, it was, you know, I, I, I didn't want to have too big of a team because I didn't want to have too, people, too many hands in the honeypot. Um, so it was really one of those things where I was like, OK, I really want to, you know, assemble who I think would be the best, um, you know. And, uh, and so, yeah, I think that that, you know, was definitely one of the best teams that I could put together, you know, taking care of some of the items that like I think that could be done, you know, a hundred times better than I could have ever done it. What's been the most challenging part of the project? Getting it done on time. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're close. I mean, <laughs> you're close. Yeah, right? I'm close. I mean, when has a construction job ever finished on time, right? I mean, the, the, you know, that's what I tell myself anyways. Um, yeah, I mean, literally, I, I think probably the most complex part of this whole project has been um, the architectural elements. I mean, you know, the, the atrium space alone, uh, I'm sure there's been a couple. Yeah, exactly. Like every single one of those elements has to be designed first. And, um, you know, and the way that I usually do it is, uh, you know, I have this idea of what I want to do in my mind. Um, and then, you know, it, you know we create like a 3D rendering of what the project is going to look like. So we can all kind of have a visual of like how things are going to fit with each other and how things are going to actually lay out, um, you know, and then from that point, it's really, you know, you start getting into the nitty gritty of it where you start, you know, you have an idea of the, what the size of the project is going to be. And then you start thinking about the different architectural elements. Um, and the way I like to do a lot of my, you know, pieces is, uh, you know, I'll work with, uh, oh, that's Stella, by the way, she's uh, the model for the evening. Um, Stella for scale. <laughs> <laughs> she, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, you start, you have an idea and like, because I love to make reference most of my pieces from actual historical, you know, structures and elements, um, you know, I'll, I'll pull out all my research and I'll, you know, I'll kind of square down. Okay. So I'm like, okay, so the niches in the back, this is the style that I want to do. I want, you know, like some like the shell format with, you know, the, the, the different elements that kind of make up that style. And then from there, you know, you, uh, you kind of create different drawings and sketches of how you want to kind of make that piece and how you want to lay it out. And then from there, you, you know, you start getting your hands there and you start making out of clay. And that's what, that's really what a lot of my architectural elements start out as, um, you know, I'll, I'll make them just out of like regular female clay, which is just super easy, you know, clay to work with. Um, and then once I kind of have, you know, it, it goes through a lot of trial and error. A lot of the pieces do end up getting crumbled up and thrown in the garbage, um, or re-sculpted into new pieces. Um, but you know, it's really, you know, the most complicated part, complicated part of that is really figuring out how these pieces are going to work with each other. Um, because you know, you're creating, you know, 
the ceiling in that room alone had over 600 different pieces. And so, you know, making sure that each one of those pieces is going to work with the other piece and not overpower the other piece um, while you're sculpting it. And, uh, you know, that that really ends up being one of the biggest challenges uh, for something like this and really just kind of figuring out how everything's going to work. And so, you know, once I have a little bit of, a, of an idea of what I want to do, I, I you know, I, I, I perfect the piece and I kind of let it sit for a little bit and I look at it and I kind of, you know, go back to it over and over again, making sure that it's the right look and it's the right scale. And then, um, and then from there I'll cast it and then I'll make, uh, you know, a mold of it. I'll make, sometimes I'll make several molds of it because especially for the ceiling that has so many pieces, I want to make sure that I'm not just relying on one mold to, you know, to make all these different pieces. And so, um, and so I'll cast, I'll make several molds of it. And then from there, you know, I'll kind of work it in, you know, there's been a lot of situations, especially with this project where I'll spend weeks working on one specific element. I'll, you know, I'll create the element, I'll cast it, you know, and then I'll, 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 you know, I'll reproduce it. And then all of a sudden I'll look at it in the space and I'm like, nope, that is not, that, that is not, it does not look how I want it to. It's overpowering other elements. And so at that point, you kind of just go right back to the drawing board and kind of figure out, okay, or like, what didn't I like about this piece? Well, how can I change it to kind of, you know, fit the look that I really want? And um, so, yeah, I mean, in real, that's been probably one of the most difficult things. And, you know, I imagine it's very similar with building real structures. You know what I mean? You, you kind of go through this design process of trial and error. And, you know, there's definitely been a lot of trial and error. <laughs> Maybe slightly more expensive on a larger scale. Yes, building, definitely more. If you're changing your mind on something, yes, definitely yes. more expensive on a larger scale. Yeah, absolutely. Can you talk about maybe with the miniature art museum what specific elements uh, were inspired by things you saw at the Nelson Atkins when you visited? Uh, what, you came out in September, I want to say. Yeah. 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 Um, um, and when you came, what what did you draw from in the structure? I think more than anything, going into the main atrium space of the Nelson Atkins, you have those massive columns. You have this beautiful ceiling. You have this beautiful stonework. Um, and that's, you know, really what, you know, stuck with me the most because that it's kind of set the tone. You know, you're in this beautiful, historic, imposing space. And, you know, when you're creating something in miniature, you know, you're like, how can I create that, have that same feeling, but in something that's going to be three feet by three feet, you know? And so that was, you know, really what I loved about that space because it, you know, the, that room itself in the Nelson Atkins plays with scale. You know, you have these massive columns that, you know, make you feel so, you make you feel like a miniature yourself. Um, and I really loved that about it. And, you know, I think that a lot of the elements that were kind of put into it, um, you know, a lot of just like the, just like the Roman and Greek inspired elements that kind of create that space. Um, you know, that was something that I really wanted to try to convey in a, on a miniature scale as well. Um, you know, and just same with like the layout of the, you know, you have this grand space that kind of welcomes you in and then sends you to these, you know, to, to view this other amazing forms of art. Um, and so I think that's really one of my biggest influences where, where that came from, you know, just the, the imposing, how, you know, how, how that room itself makes you feel like a miniature. I was like, that's, you know, how can I create that same feeling in miniature? You know, that's really what I really wanted to convey for that space. Well, can we expect to see some miniature tapestries? Because, you know, in that space, I'm slightly biased because they're my collection, but those tapestries, take a look, they're kind of important. Um, but what's interesting is that, you know, if you think about that space as, 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 as ceremonial space, I mean, and I'm looking at Steve, who can probably confirm this, it's a slightly exaggerated space, you know, it's, it's not really classical proportions, but it's a classical vocabulary. And I think you nailed it about the idea that it's meant to sort of create awe and, you know, sort of something special, something different. And you can only imagine what that must have been like in December 1933, when in, you know, the Midwest, people came in into a space like that, you know, in Union Station is similar, you know, there's these sort of that, so that, that, that sort of ceremonial public feeling that spaces like Kirkwood Hall or Union Station here in Kansas City, or you know the the old train station in Los Angeles or other places, how do you you know at a reduce at a scale level at a re, at a fine scale level, how do you c 
convey that same sort of sense of grandeur and that same kind of wait, stop, this is something special. This is something, this is not your normal space that you live in. Are those questions that you think about when you're making some of your choices? Or? Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, especially with miniatures, you know, and it, it's, you know, it kind of goes in tandem with what I was saying earlier about developing that miniature eye. Um, you know, when you're doing something in miniature, sometimes reproducing something exactly as it is in full scale doesn't exactly read the same in miniature, um, you know, because you're kind of, whereas, you know, if you're seeing something in full scale and, you know, you, you have you have to kind of look around and kind of see different things at different times. Whereas in miniature, you're seeing everything almost all at once, depend, you know, depending on the piece. You know, you're looking directly into this room and you're seeing most of the elements all at once. And so, you know, the way I love to play that up a little bit is to, you know, exaggerate just a little bit. You know, you don't want to go too crazy. You're not trying to make a wedding cake here. You're trying to make something that's, you know, bringing some of the best elements of that architectural style and showcasing them in a way that, you know, takes you on a journey from one element to the next you know what i mean you don't you don't want to just focus completely on one piece you're kind of seeing ever since you're seeing everything all at once you kind of want to have to tell a story with all those different elements um and so it really is you know trying to that balance between you know going a little crazy but not too crazy really well it's a little bit like some of the work we do as curators i mean you're actually you know you're being both an artist and a curator here because you're you know you are creating the spear conceptualizing it you're creating it but you're also, when you were talking a little bit earlier about how some things, even after like you've cast something and you're working with it, you're like, this doesn't work. I have joked in my career, like, you know, when you have a layout, you're working on the layout and you actually get in this space and you're working on stuff and you're like, whoa, this painting is fighting that painting. Like they worked on paper, <laughs> they worked in the model, they worked, you know, in, in like Illustrator or SketchUp or whatever. And in real life, they hate each other and they're like, so it's, you know, I was just struck by that idea that you're occupying a position which is rare for a lot of artists because you are being both, you know, the artist and you're also then being, you know, the curator of your own work, you know, of the individual pieces within it and thinking about the big picture and then the dives into the dives down into the, the adjacencies, the stories, the happy accidents that sometimes occur. Many and, of those. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then also the, you know, the therapist, you know, trying to prevent different elements from having unpleasant associations. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and I think that's one thing that, you know, that kind of you develop as a miniature artist. And, you know, what I love to bring, you know, what I love to, you know, people to understand is like how you know, why miniature work should be considered such, you know, high level of fine art that it is because there it is, you know, it's so many different battles and elements that are going into these pieces. You know, some people think it's just, you know, building a dollhouse and, you know, la la la, I'm putting some dolls in it. But there are ugly dollhouses out there. <laughs> yes, yes, I will. I, I will definitely agree to that. Um, and, you know, then that's what that's really, you know, what what it is, as, uh, you know, as you kind of get into it over time, you kind of start to figure out what those battles are. And, you know, you learn to, you know, pick those battles, really, and how, you know, how th things kind of work with each other and how they shouldn't work with each other. And, you know, and it's, you know, it's just you know, like I was saying, like it's literally a combination of almost every single art form, you know, so you have all those different art forms fighting for center stage. And it's like, how do you create the perfect balance between all of that? And how do you know it? Like you personally, Chris, like when you're, how do you know when you've solved the problem and when you are like, okay. Um, when I don't want to set the piece on fire anymore, <laughs> usually that's when I'm like, okay, I think I finally hit that set sweet oh. spot. <laughs> But most of the time leading up to that, I'm like, I just want to take this out to my driveway and set it on fire and never look back. <laughs> and with the comment about fire, we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, we've just got a few minutes left, but we'd be happy to take uh, a couple uh, questions um, that you have all been thinking about as we've been having the conversation up here. Um, I haven't used it yet, um, but I don't know. 
there's it's actually a very taboo subject within the miniature world now because a lot of people are come you know there's it's they're very easily available there's you know so many people are have access to them now and they're not very expensive um and uh so it, it's become a very taboo thing in the miniature world now um and the way i see it no i'm i'm not a tool purist you know what i mean like i i i don't use one myself but i appreciate it because i you know i I love advancements in technology. You know what I mean? Like it just, you know, it's the same, you know, people could argue that, you know, using a hand saw is versus using a, an electric saw is not being purist. You know what I mean? So it's, it's like that same, you know, kind of, kind of discussion where it's like, well, where, where's the line? Like, where do you lose craftsmanship at that point? You know, and, you know, I, I really think that when it comes to using tools, if you're doing, you know, especially 3d printer, Figuring out a way to use it that doesn't diminish the craftsmanship of the project, you know, and there and I believe that with a 3D printer, there is certain ways to do that. You know what I mean? Um, I think, you know, especially like there's people, you know, you can literally go on websites now and you can find something that you want in, you know, some kind of architectural element or something. And you can literally just download that file, put it in your computer, hit print and your 3D printer will print it. Um, that's where I start to have my issue with 3D printing. That's where I feel like it loses a little bit of the craftsmanship because there is no craftsmanship at that point. You know, you're kind of losing that. Um, whereas, like, I know other artists that work with 3D printing that, you know, they went to school, they studied years to learn to create their own designs digitally, um, which I personally think is way more difficult than doing it physically and, you know, tangibly because, you know, when you're working on something, you know, like I'd like to do in clay or plaster, you know, you can, you can work on it from all angles. You can, you can look at it from all the sides at once. Whereas like if you're working on it on a computer, you, you know, you have, you know, a great amount of tools, but a limited amount of things you can do with those tools. Um, so, you know, I don't discriminate it against tool, you know, what people are using to make their miniatures with, um, you know, and I think that, 3D printing is, I think it's an amazing tool for, you know, people that don't have the skill to, you know, sculpt something themselves, um, you know. And so, yeah. So, I mean, I think, I think, you know, people are allowed to use whatever tools they want at the end of the day. Um, I personally am not a huge fan of it. Um, I've, I think it's a very messy process. And so I just kind of stay away from it. I, you know, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, it's one of those things where I'm like, you know, to each his own. Um, I think it's an amazing tool. I love any kind of advancement that you see into it. I actually, I use a laser cutter for a lot of my pieces when I'm doing a lot of my, like, my basic structure work. And when I first started doing miniatures, there was people who would come out to me and be like, you're using a laser cutter. That's cheating. And I'm like, a laser cutter is literally just a saw that uses light instead of a blade, um, you know. And so it's it's really kind of finding the line of like okay where you know you know how do you preserve that craftsmanship and that's what i do you know what when i you know other people that you know talk about using laser cutters i said you know the key of using a laser cutter is making it look like you're not losing a laser cutter and that's where the craftsmanship comes in when you're doing something like that um so yeah so i you know i don't like i said don't discriminate against any tools i think you know i think it's an incredible invention i think it's amazing the things that it can do um but you know it's you know it's not for me <laughs> Oh, not at all. I love gifts. Who doesn't love gifts? <laughs> yeah, no. Like I said, I absolutely love. Oh my God, this is amazing. Uh, oh, I love that. Oh my, that's so cool. It's a little basket. I honestly didn't even know that you could do something like this with a 3D printer, so I am impressed. So <laughs> maybe I should get one. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Oh my God, thank you so much. Wow, I don't think I've ever been to a talk where the speaker was gifted something from an audience. This is amazing. amazing. I love this. Thank you so yeah. much. Uh, Anne, I think. Oh, well, perfect. <laughs> Anne? Okay. I'm one of the docents of the Detroit Miniature Museum, and it's such a gift to get to actually meet the artists and, uh, between Bill Robertson and Joe um, uh, Stories. So it's a, 
It's a pleasure to meet you. Um, the sculpture that you're doing in the atrium of the um, miniature museum is a real sculpture, or did you create? Um, so I usually, anything that I do architecturally, I always love to reference actual uh, pieces that are historical. So um, like, for example, the fountain that I've been doing, um, you know, it was like the th it was these three muses and I actually was inspired by uh, there's actually this really famous cemetery in Los Angeles, uh, one of the forest lawn cemeteries. And it's like tons of celebrities buried there. And, um, and I actually love going there because a lot of the, like the old mausoleums, like the architecture that they use for those, like it's actually really cool. And it sounds super dark, but, if you know, some some of these mausoleums and some of these, you know, crypts are actually like beautiful architectural pieces and um and so they actually there was actually this fountain that's pretty prominent there in the cemetery and that's one of the first you know especially especially when doing this piece because kansas city is so known for their fountains and i was like okay that's you know i want this piece to be you know a little bit of like a love letter to kansas city so i want certain elements of this piece to kind of tie into you know kansas city history and you know when we were kind of planning this project there was a lot of talk about you know the the fountain of the space and how you know it, it it would be awesome to tie into some kind of you know element of Kansas City and so um and so that fountain specifically you know was I wanted it to be you know to do it justice and to also be an element that kind of you know brings a little bit of you know just like whimsy to the piece itself um and so uh so yeah so a lot of the pieces that i do are usually inspired by actual elements and so i'll always you know just it's the best way that i think to kind of keep historically accurate and to, to base it off exact you know exact structures that have been built before and you know and it's a real great way i think to bring homage to those historic elements that you know some people just kind of you know, brush by, you know, as, you know, just like whatever someone's mausoleum, but I'm like, well, there's actually some incredibly beautiful architecture elements that are put into that, that, you know, you would kind of just not really appreciate, you know, on a general sense. Thank you. And Wolf, I think you had your hand up. I will let you have the last question. <laughs> No, <laughs> like I, I, I think that's, you know, it's, it's like a curse as much as it is a gift. I feel like to this day, like I'll be, I'll, I'll be going to, I'll go to McDonald's and I'll, and I'll be sitting there in the drive through line and I'll be looking at the building and I'm like, how would I make this in miniature if I had to? Not that I ever plan on making a building, you know, a McDonald's in miniature, but it's just one of those things where like, I just, it's, you literally can't turn it off at this point. It's one of the, you know, I'll look at something and I'll just be like, okay, how would I make that? You know, and I literally go through this entire process in my mind of like, okay, this is how I would make that. This is how I would kind of tweak that. And, uh, you know, and it literally happens like any, any, I'll be driving and I'll see a building that I'm like, oh, that's a cool building. And instantly my brain's like, how would you do that in miniature? And like the processes all of a sudden start, you know, f you know, start filing in of like, okay, this is, this is how I would do that. This is how I would do this. How I would do it. But, you know, it's, it's really beneficial because like, I'll, you know, the, there comes a time where I'll actually, you know, have a project that like you know have will have an element that you know it's similar to something that i've looked at before and tried to figure out how i would make that a miniature and so automatically i'm like oh yeah i already kind of figured this out when i didn't need to but yeah uh, it, you know it just kind of popped into my mind before and so it kind of you know it's yeah like i said it's a blessing as much as it is a curse <laughs> ever since i mean literally since i got here into this room a couple hours ago i've been just looking at different elements and i'm like okay how would i do that in miniature like how you know how could i how could i take that and or what could i make that out of to kind of have that same look you know so it's yeah it's definitely something that never gets turned off <laughs> <laughs> Well, I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening. I want to thank the Nelson and Adkins again for hosting us and for uh, William for being a part of the conversation tonight and Rachel Nicholson. I don't know if she is still here, but uh, also at the Nelson Adkins, who was instrumental in helping to organize everything uh, and also thank Chris for joining us and for sharing so much of your process and journey. And we're really excited to see the Miniature Art Museum at TM later this summer. And I'll just remind everyone, if you have questions and you want to learn more and talk more with Chris, 
please join us uh, tomorrow morning between 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. at the Toy and Miniature Museum, uh, and you would ha- you will have an opportunity to have a more in-depth conversation with Chris. So thank you all again. And see some amazing miniatures. <laughs> yeah.